Were you more of a uh, Cartoon Network person or a Nickelodeon person? Cartoon Network. I'd have to agree. And then Toonami After Dark. What was up? Every I, Saturday, Toonami. I never really stuck around for Toonami. <sighs> I would wait until Toonami was over and then watch Adult Swim. I watched all of it. Yeah. I Wake up in the friggin' middle of the night to Inuyasha's end of end credits playing. Yeah. Super loud. <laughs> What was that song? That was Inuyasha end credits. <laughs> what a jam. Right off the top, I want to say we are going to be doing a public live stream. If you're listening to this on the day it comes out, doing a public live stream on YouTube tomorrow. Uh, I don't know what time. We didn't really pick a time, but it's going to happen tomorrow. So just uh, set your watches for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we're going to do a live stream. We're going to talk about all the cool and exciting changes that we uh, just came out with. If you're listening to this, came out today. And we're going to drink um, a really old beer that we haven't had in a while. And um, just kind of hang out and talk. And then we're planning on playing some playing some games. I'm excited. We're going to do some video games afterwards on Twitch, on our Twitch channel. All that information will be out tomorrow check in with our socials we'll have everything you need to know about our changes and join us on our live stream it'll be fun come say hi we're just gonna hang out it'll be a lot of fun what a plan what a plan welcome <laughs> <laughs> to the 46th episode 46 yeah 46 is it 46 it's 46 you looked at me like i was wrong 46th episode, I had to double check, mm. of Beer and Fear. My name is Zach. My name is Paige. Yeah. <laughs> Get pumped. Me. <laughs> Me. Uh, this is also our first uh, video podcast. Um, also, so you can see us. People can see us now. If you're just listening to this, look in the, the notes on how you can watch us. And it's also, um, we'll, we'll go into that a little bit later. But um, episode 46 is about heights the fear of heights um slash falling mm. i'll talk a little bit about falling i crammed in all my notes last minute again <laughs> um so we'll talk a little bit about falling too but fear of heights before we get into fear of heights you had a you had a pretty good week you had to talk about your week i just got back from vegas yes i'm a so few jealous days ago, i just got back uh it was hot mm -hmm. but it was a nice heat mm -hmm. i drank a lot i smoked a lot <laughs> Oh, yeah. Went to a lot of good restaurants. I got to spend time with my family, spent time with my sisters, watched my parents renew their vows, mm. which was beautiful. I cried. Magical stuff. Mm-hmm. Love. It's hard to come by. You were, uh, yeah, sending me uh, photos of the cocktails you had and of uh, all the food you were eating, and that was making me so jealous because you had some pretty damn good food. Gordon right Ramsay's Steakhouse. I got one of the best steaks I've ever had in my life. Ridiculous. Uh, second only to my father's cooking. <laughs> Sorry, Gordon. <laughs> Gotta say that. It's facts. It's a nice compliment. <laughs> if I told that to him, he'd just look at me like I lost my mind. <laughs> he does not accept compliments. It's a dad thing. They're just Ugh. like, mm-mm. That looked like a good steak, though. Oh, it's my God. Wagyu Woo! filet. Mm -hmm. It had crab legs on top of it, like little pieces of crab. Like, they were, like, this big, like, decent size, really delicious sauce, like, oh, my God, and scallops, some of the best scallops I've ever had. Unbelievable. Went to a place called Trevi, and I had, uh, what was it, crispy skin salmon. Mm. Amazing. So good. And I had a blackberry martini, I think, or Cosmo, something like that. It was so good. You had you said you had a, a – did you have a blackberry mule? No. Was that it? Okay. You I did have a mule. Moscow mule, yeah. But I had, um, I had two mules while I was there. I had a passion mule from Gordon Ramsay's, and I had mm. a blackberry 
No, that's a, that wasn't a Mew. That was a Mojito. Those were good. That, yeah. That's what it was. Blackbird Mojito, yeah. Yeah, well, that was at the pool. That that's, was good. Oh, man. Um, you can drink in the streets in Vegas, so, you know, it's oh, just yeah. a lot of people walking around mm-hmm. drinking. So we got, uh, I went to a place called Fat Tuesday, uh, Tuesdays, I think, uh, and got like a really good slushy drink. Mm. Um, uh, my sister's got a daiquiri, like this huge, is this thing, this huge mango daiquiri, and then wow. one of them got a pineapple daiquiri. It was delicious. Jealous. It was so good. Um, we went to a candy store called I Love Sugar, <laughs> and I picked out like an insane amount of chocolate. Oh, yeah. Um, what else? Uh, oh, we went to a Mexican restaurant called Chayo, mm. and I got a shrimp burrito that was freaking massive, and it was probably some of the best guacamole and salsa I've ever had. Like, it was just solid. Gosh. It was really good. It all sounds amazing. It was wonderful. I also picked up something for you while I was there. It's just a little something. Just a small little something that I thought was just wonderful. You're so nice. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I caught a a quick glance at this. I didn't know if it was... uh, It looked like a ball sack at first. (laughs) I was like, wait, no, you got to show me when when we're recording. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, that's pretty. I like the colors on it. Mm-hmm. A couple titties on there, too. It's nice. <laughs> I go. got a Las Vegas titty keychain. Las Vegas titty keychain. And if you're watching the video, you can see it. It's pretty. I like it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I guess I need to start carrying around a keychain Keychain again. My key's in a keychain. Thank you so much. I just like how fat her ass is. <laughs> what was I going to say? Oh, did you gamble? Um, my sisters tried to get me to do a slot machine, so I like pressed the button once. <laughs> <laughs> that was, uh, I don't like gambling. The extent of your gambling? You pushed a button once? It's all high risk, no reward. Yeah. It's luck. Yeah, they rake in a ton of money. With that a stuff. lot of money. That's yeah. how they, you know, Before stay everything. so yeah. <laughs> well off in Vegas. Yep. So those casinos stay up and running. It's a dangerous cycle. You're eating good food, expensive food, and you're drinking a shit ton. And then you're feeling lucky and you go gamble and you lose all your money and then rinse and repeat. Yeah. So I. Oh, and then some drug use in there too, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was all out of fun. The flight was really nice. I mostly napped mm. um, there and back. <laughs> of course. But it was it was wonderful. Jealous. Happy to be home. Good. I'm happy you're here. I missed my buddy. Yeah, I missed you too. Oh. <clears throat> what about you, bud? I got a new car. Yeah, you did. I got a. I purchased a new vehicle on Friday, uh, and it is a 20, 2021 Mazda six. So the same make and model as my old car. My other one was a fourteen. I bought it used. This one is brand new, twenty twenty one, and I got the carbon edition, which is a limited edition that they came out with in their twenty twenty one line. So it's got a poly metal gray exterior finish. So I didn't go with the red like my old car. I was torn between the red and the this one, but it's a gray silverish finish on the outside and red leather interior seats on the inside, sexy. which looks so fucking sexy. Um, and it drives super nice. I love it. It's great. It's got way more than I need, but um, I am enjoying it. I'm loving it. I'm very happy. My wallet, not so much, um, but uh, I'm not going to wood that. Um, this one lasts me much longer than my other one did, and uh, I'm going to be driving a lot safer now. I mean, I wasn't driving recklessly when I wrecked my car. It's just, it was shitty. Vehicle accidents suck. Drive defensively. Yep. Drive defensively, because everyone else out there is driving like an asshole. Mm-hmm. Driving like an idiot. That's really the highlight of my week. Uh, the other things I have written down is, um, I know we talked about it at the top of the episode, but we have a new website where you can watch all of our, you know, listen to all of our stuff. All of our stuff's combined together. We'll talk a little bit more about this on our live stream tomorrow. But it's beerandfearcast.com. Super cool. Check it out. You can check it out right now. If you're listening, pull out your phone. Go on your computer, beerandfearcast.com. Do it. Look at how amazing it is. And um, we're going to have a post coming out tomorrow if you're listening to this on Wednesday that talks about everything including the all the changes and the live stream that we got going on. You are making a funny face. <laughs> um, but that's all the news for this week. 
That's all I have to share. And that's and that's the, the news. news. <laughs> Signing off for ABC. Time is seventeen fifty one. This is um, Walter Con- uh, Cronkite. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's get into the beer. Lay it on me, Daddy O. Our beer for yeah. episode forty six on heights yeah. is called Great Heights. Uh, okay. By Outer Range Brewing Co. We've never had them. Nope, brand new. Outer Range Brewing, called Great Heights. Outer Range Brewing Co. is located at 182 Lusher Court in Frisco, Colorado. Oh my god, we have an out-of-stater. 80443. So we got a Colorado beer, our first, I think, Colorado beer. And this is a little bit about Outer Range from their website and from their Facebook. Since 2016, Outer Range Brewing Co. has focused on brewing the great styles of craft beer that inspire us, Belgians and IPAs. We strive to become a place of inspiration for the people who choose to leave the life below. Um, From their Facebook, we brew the variations of the beers that inspire us, Belgians and IPAs. We are passionate about craft beer and about you enjoying it in the best way possible. You can bring food or order it next door. They have received uh, such accolades, um, 2018 Top 15 Breweries in the U.S. by Hop, Hop Culture. Okay. Uh, 2019 Top 20 Hazy IPA Brewers in the U.S. I by like a ha- a hazy IPA. Beer and Brewing. And 2019 Top 50 Best New Breweries by Beer Advocate. So on their website, they have a press section in their about area, and they have all these different awards and accolades that they received. So these guys are super cool. The brewery also houses a place called Birdcraft. Which is a fried chicken place with a Ooh. Thai-ish spin. So they do like a Thai spin on fried chicken. Their menu looks incredible, and all of their beers sound delicious. So they've got like fried chicken plates that you can order. They've got some poke bowls, too. Um, oh, God, I want poke. Yeah, they've got a lot of good fried chicken things, some chicken sandwiches. I need poke in my life now. All very good, yep. What the fuck? You can find Outer Range um, at Outer Range Brewing on Facebook, Outer Range Brew on Twitter, and Outer Range Brewing Co., on Instagram. Uh, with this beer, I couldn't find a description anywhere. I even looked on their Facebook page, tried to find when it was released, like mm-hmm. if they made a post about it, what they had to say about it, but I couldn't. Um, this beer is also no longer listed on their website. So mm. it's uh, probably older, but I am happy I managed to find it. This is a double dry hopped Imperial Triple IPA. Imperial Triple IPA. Double dry hopped Imperial Triple IPA. That is a lot. Yes. Untra- uh, Untapped says it's a New England IPA. So, I don't know. I mean, Imperial just means it's higher ABV. So does Triple. Um, so, I don't know if it's a New England IPA or what, but I guess we'll find out when does we drink it. Does that mean it's Triple Triple? Triple Triple. Du- uh, double dry hopped Imperial Triple. So, it's it was double dry hopped three times. I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't know. It's a triple, it, instead of a double IPA, it's a triple IPA. I'll, I'll talk about it. Okay. Uh, we've talked about and drank plenty of IPAs on the show, so I won't say too much. According to craftbeer.com, they're typically lighter in color, SRM, higher in bitterness, IBU, and higher in alcohol content, ABV. They're also good to pair with bone-in pork chops, miso salmon, rich cheeses, and carrot cake. Okay. I love, I love carrot cake. I do like carrot cake. Uh, and then I found this online, a couple websites. What's the difference between double and triple IPAs? The Brewers Association defines an American India Pale Ale as having an ABV of 6.3 to 7.5%, while an Imperial or Double IPA should fall somewhere in the 7.6 to 10.6 range. So if reason stands, a triple IPA then should be any IPA with an ABV roughly over 10.5%, right? If only it were that simple. Sierra Nevada recently re- uh, released Hoptim- Hoptimum. Hoptimum. Like Optimum? Like Optimum, but with hops. Got it. An all-new, quote, all-new triple IPA that comes in at a head-scratching 9.6%, securely within double IPA range. Similarly, for their fourth anniversary, Boston Boston's Trillium Brewing Co. released The Streets, a celebrated triple IPA tipping the ABV scales at 10%. Okay. Uh, one true example of the style can be found in Founders Brewing Company's 12% Whopper, devil dancer so these companies have been releasing triple ipas what they brand as triple ipas but they're i mean they're in between the 7.6 to 10.6 percent which are considered double ipas or imperial ipas so this all goes to say like lots of things in beer this all really just comes down to marketing when it comes to hoppy beers best to go by the abv rather than the style 
same sort of thing we discussed like New England IPAs versus hazy IPAs and like the distinction there. Most of it's marketing. Some people argue it's their distinctive styles, but they're most of the time referring to the same thing. Um, so some argue all triple means is higher ABV or more malt and hops, which results in higher ABV and IBU. So that's triple. I understood all of that. Cool. And imperial, again, means a stronger version of a typical beer. So it's going to be a strong beer. This was out of stock at every Benny's store, and I didn't think I'd be able to get it. I saw the name. I was like, that's perfect beer for Heights. Um, but I, So I just Googled the beer, the beer name and the brewery, and it was in stock at a place called The Open Bottle oh. in Lockport. Oh, that sounds cute. So that's where I went. It's just a beer store. So they sell mostly beer, and they have other spirits and wines and things like that, too. I walked in. place is very small. They've got some high tops to sit down, and I guess you can order beer. And I don't know if they've got food. I wasn't in there very long. But um, it's like your beer section at Binnie's where they categorize it by region of the U.S. They have a giant Illinois local beer section in the middle. And then all of their shelves, they have a different beer from across the country. So this place had it uh, to order. So I was really happy about that. Drove down to Lockport and picked some up. The open bottle, Lockport. Check them out. I want to check them out now. This is brewed with Mosaic, Strata, Hollertau, and Goldings Hops. Well, we've had Mosaic and we've had Hollertau. Mm -hmm. I think we may have had Strata also. Possibly. But uh, also Golding sounds familiar. All the hops yeah, blur together. Exactly. We've had so many beers now. This is 12% ABV, unknown IBU or SRM. No score on Beer Advocate. It's got zero reviews, two ratings with an average rating of 4.27. Did you look into when it came out? I tried to find it. Couldn't. I couldn't see it. It's not on their website anymore. So, And I know this. Uh, the brewery has been around since about 2016. Yeah. Um, so it had to be maybe within the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not, not on draft anymore at their brewery, and they don't sell bottles or cans of it. So I don't know. And there's no description of it either. So it's just uh, like a hidden gem. And uh, Well, that remains to be tasted. Yeah. Good on, good on open bottle for stocking this. I was very happy. I'll go grab it. Excitement. Breaking these bad babies out again. Spiegel out ah, glasses. sticky. Yeah, the bottom of it is a little sticky. Um, I, I don't know how they had this stored, but um, out of range brewing co. Leave the life below. Great Heights Double Dry Hop Triple India Pale Ale. I looked at the brewery on like Google Maps, and just it's fucking gorgeous. Like mountains, well, and nice. uh, the inside looks really nice. Um, yeah, super super cool. Smells pretty good. It smells happy. This definitely smells happy. As I wait for my foam. <laughs> oh, it smells better in the glass. Oh, I'm sure. That is a nice looking beer. It looks like a hazy IPA. Yeah. Got the nice color. dark orange juice look. Mm-hmm. This foam likes to stick around. It is very frothy. What was that other one that we had? Um, that transient one? Shapes and lines? Mm -hmm. Similar. All of these are kind of starting to... Uh, we did a lot of New England hazy IPAs like the last 10 episodes, and they all yeah, kind of blended one, together. It's got a different smell to it, yeah. though, I would say. It's a little more... Got a little more fruit to it. Yeah. I don't know what uh, what that, that smell is, though. But... Um, Definitely it's still very woodsy and hoppy. Uh, that's, I think, the dominant scent. Look at that. See the lacing, though, on that foam? Isn't that weird? I mean, yeah. Oh, those looks are like, some weird stumps. It looks like uh, cobwebs. <laughs> eh. Someone that has tryptophobia would not like this. Hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The holes. The holes. <laughs> the holes. The holes. It's kind of warm. I could have put it in the freezer, but, I mean, it's not... It's not super warm. It's still cold. It's actually pretty good. I just don't know what what that is. The the fruit. Mm, there's really no bite behind it. No, it's like an initial tingle when it hits your tongue, but then otherwise it's just very smooth yep. going down. Uh, hardly any com or carbonation to it. It's very lacy and, and stumpy, like Paige likes to say. Um, stumpy. But it's uh, the carbonation is very low on it. Just I don't know. It I think the f 
just like the scent, the flavor of the hops also kind of dominates. Um, I like how they all kind of intermingle together, though. It's a, definitely a unique flavor and, and combination with those four hops. Not anything super basic. It is com- it's, it's a complex beer, like uh, compared to the Kronik's Fix Secret from Saint Arat, where that one was pretty pretty straightforward, single hop variety, which it was delicious beer, by the way, but. This one's definitely got a little more depth to the flavor. How does it pair with uh, cookies and cream Chex Mix? Not well. Not well? Okay. All right. Noted. Yeah, not well. Um, I am not very partial to this beer. Okay. Care to elaborate? I need to take another drink. Okay. I'm I'm getting uh, maybe a little bit of orange, um, orange or what's a smaller orange? Tangerine. Sure. A cutie. Yeah, like orangish. I don't know how to properly explain this. I just find it lacking, or kind of just like out of all like we've had really good hazy IPAs before. Yeah. And then I just don't think that this is like bam. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I feel like there's definitely a lot of a lot of fruit to it, though, that I can't quite pinpoint. Um, I keep looking up at our shelf that you can't really see, but yeah, we had a lot of. Um, you're right. We had a lot of hazy IPAs. What was the last one that we just had by Saint Laurent? The one we just it, had. It wasn't. A, it wasn't. A, I don't think it was. Was that a hazy IPA? The sour. Uh, not the one we just had was sour. The one before that. Terror Dome? Terror Dome. Was that a hazy IPA? I think so. I mean, I'm looking right at it. Oh, Double Dry Hopped IPA. Mm. I don't know if it was a New England hazy IPA or not, but that one was uh, probably my favorite. I thought it was really good. So, yeah, I, I think you're right compared to the some of the other ones that we've had. Maybe not top on the charts, but it, I, I still really like it. I don't remember what I gave Terror Dome. You actually rated it less than uh, the Blackberry Grunt. Well, I mean, the Blackberry Grunt was amazing. It was amazing. I still I put Teradome, I think, above that. I'm just kind of like, meh about this one. Could be colder. I agree. It's on me. Should have put it in the freezer. But I also have like a slight headache. So I don't think that helps. I, I feel like it has potential, I guess, would be the way to describe it. It's tasty. It's fruity. It's, Let's rate it. It's hoppy. Paige, tell us about the fear of heights. Well, I don't have a fear of heights, but I have a fear of commitment, so I can tell you about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Acrophobia. It's an extreme or irrational fear or phobia of heights, especially when one is not particularly high up. It belongs to a category of specific phobias called space and motion discomfort that share both similar causes and options for treatment. Most people experience a degree of natural fear when exposed to heights known as the fear of falling. On the other hand, those who have little fear of such exposure, uh, exposure are said to have a head for heights. A head for heights? That's a, that the opposite yeah. of a fear? Okay. A head for heights is uh, advantageous for those hiking or climbing in mountainous terrain and also in certain jobs such as steeple jackets or steeple jacks. I don't know I said jackets. <laughs> or wind turbine mechanics. Like, oh, jeez. Uh, yeah. Have you, okay, sorry to interrupt so early on, but look at, if I can find this video quickly, from my last trip to Michigan, look at this. That's big. So I, I was driving around, because they're all over the place, up up near Lennington, near our house, uh-huh. and I drove down the path, and I just walked up to one, and you don't realize how massive they are until... Like you're you're looking up the shaft of one. <laughs> uh, they're they're enormous, um, and it's it's almost frightening in a way. I've had that described uh, about me. <laughs> seeing that thing tower over you. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's just I don't know. People with acrophobia can experience a panic attack in high places and become too agitated to get themselves down safely. Approximately 2 to 5% of the general population has acrophobia, with twice as many women affected as men. 
It's like the people who all of a sudden they see like they're really high up and they have to get down to the ground yes. and like crawl away. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the term is from the Greek akron, meaning peak, summit, edge, and phobos, meaning fear. Mm-hmm. The cause for acrophobia uh, has been attributed to a conditioning or a traumatic experience. Um, recent doubts, uh, recent studies have cast doubt on this explanation. Individuals with acrophobia are found to be lacking in traumatic experiences. Nevertheless, this may be due to the failure to recall the experiences as memory fades as time passes. And also, some people just repress their traumatic experiences. Sure. To address the problems of self-report and memory... A large cohort study with 1,000 participants was conducted from birth. The results showed that participants with less fear of heights had more injuries because of falling. More studies have suggested a possible explanation for acrophobia is that it emerges through acclimation of non-traumatic experiences of falling that are not memorable, but can influence behaviors in the future. Also, fear of heights may be acquired when infants learn to crawl. If they fell, they would learn the concepts about surfaces, posture, balance, and movement. Interesting. Cognitive factors may also contribute. You're just going to just leave that there. Contribute to the development of acrophobia. Uh, people tend to wrongly interpret visual vestibular discrepancies as dizziness oh, and yeah, nausea I do that all the time. <laughs> constantly <laughs> and associate them with a forthcoming fall. Hmm. A traumatic conditional event of falling may not be necessary at this point. A fear of falling along with a fear of loud noises is one of the most commonly associated, um, commonly suggested inborn or non-associative fears. The newer non-association theory is that a fear of heights is an evolved adaptation to a world where falls posed a significant, uh, significant danger. If this fear is inherited, it is possible that people can get rid of it by frequent exposure of heights and habit- uh, habitation. Mm-hmm. I'm not habitation, habituation. Two very different things. Very obviously. different things. I'm fine, I swear. It's, this is 12%. <laughs> I took like a few sips. Is it really 12%? Yeah. Jeez. Maybe I should drink more of it. <laughs> uh, in other words, acrophobia could be attributed to the lack of exposure in early times. The degree of fear varies, and the term phobia is reserved for those at the extreme end of the spectrum. Researchers have argued that a fear of heights is an instinct found in many mammals including domestic animals and humans. Experiments usually um, using visual cliffs have shown human infants and toddlers as well as other animals of various ages to be reluctant in venturing onto a glass floor with a view of a few meters of apparent fall space below it. Although human infants initially experience fear when crawling on the visual cliff, most of them overcame the fear through practice, exposure, and mastery and retained a level of healthy conscious, uh, cautiousness. While an innate cautiousness around heights is helpful for survival, an extreme fear can interfere with the activities of everyday life, such as standing on a ladder or chair Mm -hmm. or even walking up a flight of stairs. Still, it is uncertain if acrophobia is related to the failure to reach a certain developmental stage. Besides associative accounts, a diathetic... Yeah, diathetic stress model is also very appealing for considering both vicarious learning and hereditary factors such as personality traits. Another possible contributing factor is the dysfunction in maintaining balance. In this case, the anxiety is both well-founded and secondary. The human balance system integrates (sighs) (laughs) uh, proprioceptive vestibular and nearby visual cues to uh, reckon position and motion. Recon? Reckon. Reckon. I I reckon. reckon. As height increases, visual cues recede and balance becomes poorer even in normal people. Hmm. However, most people respond by shifting to more reliance on the vestibular branches of the equilibrium system and the, the proprioceptive. Yeah, proprioceptive. I'm super aware of those. <laughs> Some people are known to be more dependent on visual signals than others. People who rely more on visual cues to control body movements are less physically stable. An acrophobic, however, continues to overly rely on visual signs, um, signals. I don't know why I keep saying signs. I can read. I'm not literate. Whether because of inadequate vestibular function or incorrect strategy. Locomotion at a high um, elevation requires more than normal visual processing. Yeah. Locomotion. The visual cortex becomes overloaded, resulting in confusion. Some proponents of the alternative view of acrophobia warn that it may be ill-advised to encourage acrophobics to expose themselves to height without first resolving the vestibular issues. Research is underway at several clinics. Of course. Yeah, it all makes sense. 
Recent studies found that uh, participants experienced increased anxiety not only during elevation and height, but also when they were required to move sideways in a fixed height. Hmm. 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 Um... ICD-10 and DSMV are used to diagnose acrophobia. Their assessments. Oh, okay. Acrophobia questionnaire is a self-report that contains 40 items assessing anxiety level on a 0 to 6 point scale and degree of avoidance on a 0, or 0 to 2 scale. The attitude towards heights questionnaire and behavioral avoidance tests are also used. What a specific questionnaire. What's your attitude towards height? I mean, I feel like there's a questionnaire for everything to help diagnose all kinds of ailments or disorders or phobias. Hmm. Acrophobic in individuals tend to have biases in self-report. They often overestimate the danger and question their abilities of addressing, uh, addressing height-relevant issues. Traditional treatment of phobias is still in use today. Its underlying theory states that phobic anxiety is conditioned and triggered by a conditional stimulus. By avoiding phobic situations, anxiety is reduced. However, avoidance behavior is reinforced through negative reinforcement. Wolpe. Wolpe. W-O-L-P-E. Wolpe. Wolpe developed a technique called systematic desensitiz uh, desensitization to help participants avoid avoidance. Research results have suggested that even with a decrease in therapeutic contact, desensitization is still very effective. However, other studies have shown that therapists play an essential role in acrophobia treatment. Treatments like reinforced practice and self-efficiency... Efficiency? Efficacy? Efficacy. Thank you. Treatments also emerged. Mm -hmm. There have um, also been a number of studies into using virtual reality therapy for acrophobia. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Botello colleagues and Schneider, Botello and colleagues and Schneider, specifically Schneider, utilized, um, they were the first to use VR in, in treatment, but mm -hmm. they utilized inverted lenses and binoculars to alter the reality. Do you say binoculars or but binoculars? I, I say binoculars. I say binoculars. Binoculars? Yeah. Nevada, Nevada. What's a, what's a mononocular? <laughs> <laughs> Just, isn't that a telescope? <laughs> Uh, later in the mid-1990s, VR became computer-based and was widely available for therapists. A cheap VR equipment uses a normal PC with head-mounted display. In contrast, VRET uses an advanced computer automatic virtual environment called CAVE for short. VR has several advantages over, uh, over in, vo in vivo treatment. Mm -hmm. Therapists can control the situation better by manipulating the stimuli in terms of their quality, intensity, duration, and frequency. VR can help participants avoid public embarrassment and protect their confidentiality. That's incredible. Therapist's office can be well-maintained, and VR encourages more people to seek treatment, as well as it saving time and money, as participants do not need to leave the consulting room. Yep. Virtual reality is just impressive with the amount of applications that it has um, medically. I mean, I, most people, when they think about virtual reality... I feel like, well, I, I guess I shouldn't say most people, but me, when I think about virtual reality, when someone mentions virtual reality, mm -hmm. I just think of video games. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of VR games yeah, out same. there. Yeah, same. And that's, I mean, that's awesome in its own regard, but it, it VR has so many different applications that you can't even imagine, you can't even think of. People are still, I mean, it's still a very new thing, so people are coming out with more and more applications for it. But I think it's super advantageous and helpful, and this is one, uh, this is evidence of it, for sure. It can be confused with vertigo. Mm -hmm. Now, vertigo is incorrectly used to describe a fear of heights, but is more accurately a spinning sensation that occurs when one is not actually spinning. It can be triggered by looking down from a high place, by looking straight up at a high place or tall object, or be even or even by watching something, i.e. a car or a bird. So it's less, it's less the actual fear of heights and more of the reaction or not symptom, but the experience you... Uh, have when um, at a high place, yes. right? It's more of like what happens to you? Yes. I would say yes. Mm -hmm. uh, true vertigo can also be triggered by almost any type of movement, standing up, sitting down, walking, change in visual perspective, squatting down, walking up or down stairs, looking out the window of a moving car or train. Vertigo is called height vertigo when the sensation of vertigo is triggered by heights. Mm. While the fear of falling is called basophobia, 
So it's a nat uh, natural fear and is typically is typical of most humans and mammals in varying degree varying degrees of extremity. It differs from acrophobia, although the two are both closely related. The fear of falling encompasses the anxieties accompanying the, the sensation and the possibly dangerous effects of falling as opposed to the heights themselves. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. I, um, I don't consider myself to be uh, or to have a fear of heights, to possess a fear of heights. I don't either. Although when I do end up in a, in a high place, whether it's like a roller coaster or um, climbing a mountain, as I do so often out here in <laughs> Illinois... Um, or, or just being high up, I do get a little bit of a sort of, not really a panic attack or a fear sensation, but it, it just sort of makes me a little uneasy. Um, but I'm, I'm able to suppress that. I'm able to control that. It doesn't overwhelm me to the point where I need to get on the floor and crawl away. Um, I don't think I necessarily have a fear of heights, but it definitely, it, it definitely gives me a, a sensation of... You know, watch the fuck out. Watch where you're. Watch where you're stepping. Um, and I think that's that's normal in everyone. I think evolution plays a big part in that. I think that's present in most people. Where it's like, if you're high up, obviously your brain reacts a certain way. Uh, you end up being a lot more cautious and aware of your surroundings and and you know what what you're doing so that sure. you don't it, you 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 uh, acknowledge the danger associated with it. Uh, the last time I was very high up somewhere, I went. I was in Michigan again, um, and there was a overlook. They had some sort of water treatment facility near Ludington, and I climbed up this huge mountain. It went zigzag, and I got all the way to the top, and there's this big sort of cabin type thing that you can overlook, and you can see so far away, and it's it, it was incredible, but definitely got that sensation as well. I mean, I'm more impressed by seeing so far and just the beauty of everything more than uh my, my fear of heights same thing with roller coasters i mean i get a little anxious but i fucking love roller coasters and i used to hate them um really yeah i was deathly afraid of roller coasters love them i i don't know why i mean now that i'm now that i love them it's, it's difficult for me to think back to how i felt when i was you know had an adverse reaction to them but you could not get me on a roller coaster you couldn't pay me enough to get on one and then over time i eventually started going on different ones that were you know more chill more relaxed and worked my way up and like now the caterpillar right yeah now i love them and that also made me think of my mom who at a young age had brain surgery uh she used to be right-handed and after her brain surgery, she's now left-handed and has difficulty doing some things with her right side. Um, whether that, you know, that's balance, it has affected her equilibrium. So her right arm or her right leg, um, walking, maintaining balance, like she wouldn't be able to stand on her right leg and keep balance. When she picks things up and with her right hand, she has a hard time uh, with motor function with mm -hmm. her right side. And she is also pretty afraid of heights so whenever we like when we go up to michigan i'm gonna keep talking about ludington but during our trip to michigan there is a bridge that goes pretty high up in the air and you can see all around you and she gets very anxious when we go over that bridge um just even in a car that's moving along a road mm -hmm. totally safe in this vehicle it it definitely freaks her out she has to close her eyes and then just not think about it and once we're over the bridge oh, she's hey, fine when are you going to move your mom <laughs> Uh, I'm waiting for her to get back to me. Oh, I was going to request him off. Yeah, she, I will let you know as soon as I know. But yeah, she, she has a hard time going over bridges or being in high places. And I think it may have something to do with her brain surgery or her uh, effect, the, the effect that it had on her equilibrium too. So I think those two might go hand in hand. But I don't know. It doesn't affect me too much, but I can, I can understand how that's kind of built into everyone uh, to some degree. Sure. It's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it would be a natural fear, like mm -hmm. just like one of those like baser, like you know, like a fear of being set on fire or fear of darkness. <laughs> yes, right? mm -hmm. makes sense. One of those natural, like ingrained um, survival instincts. Yes, makes sense to me. So I'm going to talk a little bit about falling. Mm -hmm. My section kind of. Is similar to your section where I'll have some research in here, but I, I do have some stories towards the end. So, 
Falling is the actually the second leading cause of accidental death worldwide after motor vehicle collisions, which is number one, if you believe it, and a major cause of personal injury, especially for the elderly. Hmm. Long-term exercise appears to decrease the rate of uh, falls in older people. About 226 million cases of significant accidental falls occurred in 2015, which resulted in 527,000 deaths. Damn. Out of those 226 million cases, that's 23%. That's very high. Died, yeah. This is an increase from approximately 341,000 deaths reported in 1990. Doesn't that just show you that our bodies are squishy and can't handle impacts? Uh, going back to my car accident, it's like, again, I still tell myself I'm grateful to have walked away from that. Yeah. That was insane. The severity of injury increases with the height of the fall, but also depends on body and surface features and the manner of the body's impacts against the surface. The chance of surviving increases if landing on a highly deformable surface such as snow or water, uh, okay. anything that can sort of flex with your fall. In the occupational setting, falling incidents are commonly referred to as slips, trips, and falls, STFs. They are an important topic for occupational safety and health services. Any unprotected side or edge, which is six feet or more above a lower level, should be protected from falling by the use of a guardrail system, safety net system, or personal fall arrest system. Um, my buddy Eric, who is in Cellarets, yes, my band, uh, he is a carpenter. That's his main job, full-time job. He works on houses and construction. And he's told me several times that he he'd be working on roofs of houses or, you know, higher levels of houses with no sort of support system. Oh, lovely! And I mean, he says it's fucking scary. And I was like, yeah, dude, you should have something like a tether or something at least. Yeah, it's uh, a little ridiculous. Um, definitely a dangerous profession. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health (NIOSH) has compiled certain known risk factors that have been found responsible for STFs in the workplace. While falling can occur at any time and by any means in the workplace, these factors have been known to cause same-level falls, which are like, less likely to occur than falls to a lower level. Some workplace factors include spills on walking surfaces, ice, precipitation, loose mats or rugs, boxes or containers, poor lighting, and uneven walking surfaces. Work organization factors include a fast work pace, or work tasks involving liquids or greases. And individual factors include age, employee fatigue, failing eyesight or use of bifocals, or inappropriate loose or for, uh, poor fitting footwear. Injuries caused by falls from buildings vary depending on the building's height and the age of the person. Falls from a building's second story usually cause injuries but are not fatal. Overall, the height at which 50% of children die from a fall is between four and five story heights, about 40 to 50 feet above the ground. At one point, falling was the most common cause of injury seen in emergency departments in the U.S. One study found that there were nearly 7.9 million ER visits involving falls, nearly 35.7% of all encounters. Jesus. So it's up there. There are also... Uh, intentionally caused falls, such as jumpers, or cases of defenestration. Oh yeah, defenestration. I'm, De very, I'm well aware. <laughs> well versed. Defenestration uh, is um, throwing something out of a window. Oh, couldn't just there's say, a word for it. Couldn't just say throwing something out yeah. of a window. Throwing something out of a window or being thrown out of a, out of a window is it, so. If you were thrown out of a window, you will have been defenestrated. Watch it. I'm going to defenestrate this guy. Yep. So the highest documented, oh, I'll talk about both of those, jumpers and defenestration. The highest documented suicide jump was by skydiver Charles Nish Bruce, who killed himself by leaping without a parachute from an airplane at an altitude of over 5,000 feet. Was it like a, a public airplane or like a private airplane? I don't know. I, I didn't look into the details of that. I don't, it'd be interesting to see the context kind of, of that. Was he like a skywriter that had like one of those like old school planes and he was like, Wendy, will you marry me? And then because <laughs> I paid him to and then he like crashed and like killed himself. Maybe. Maybe he had a co-pilot. Maybe that's exactly how it happened. I don't know. He was a skydiver and he jumped without a parachute. Um, and then defenestration, uh, one case that I picked on May 16th, 1562, which. Wait, it was the highest jump? 
Uh, that was the highest documented suicide jump. How high was it? Uh, of over 5,000 feet. Okay, go ahead. On May 16, 1562, which I was going to say, it's impressive to me, like, because we've had multiple episodes where we talked about history, like mm-hmm. historic events that's happened. Like you talked about choking, people who choked in, like, the 6th century, you know? I think it's impressive that the, these cases have made it to present day. Mm-hmm. Like, people have documented this, and it's... It hasn't been lost in time, you know. I think that's just really cool. But on May 16, 1562, Adam Khan, Akbar's general and foster brother, was defenestrated twice for twice? murdering a rival general, Ataga Khan, who had been recently promoted by Akbar. Akbar was woken up in the tumult after the murder. He struck Adam Khan down personally with his fist and immediately ordered his defenestration by royal order. The first time, his legs were broken as a result of the 50, um, sorry, 40-foot fall from the ramparts of Agra Fort, but he remained alive. Akbar, in a rare act of cruelty probably exacerbated by his anger at the loss of his favorite general, ordered his defenestration a second time, killing him. Mm. Adam Khan had wrongly counted on the influence of his mother and Akbar's wet nurse, Maham Anga, to save him, as she was almost an unofficial uh, regent in the days of Akbar's youth. Akbar personally informed Maham Anga of her son's death, to which she famously commented, You have done well. She died 40 days later of acute depression. Acute depression. Uh, there's also self defenestration or auto defenestration. Which involves throwing yourself out of a window. That's so specific. Yeah. Self-defenestration. Uh, one example is uh, stunt performers. Like on a movie. Sure. Or in a you know, public gathering for a stunt show. Is there a term for throwing yourself out of a door? I don't know. That'd be a good, good thing to Google. <laughs> Just wondering. A falling person at low altitude typically reaches terminal velocity of 120 miles per hour after about 12 seconds falling some 1,500 feet in that time. Without alterations to their aerodynamic profile, the person maintains the speed without falling any faster. Terminal velocity at higher altitudes is greater due to the thinner atmosphere and consequent lower air resistance. And I've got some stories of people who survived Great Falls. In World War II, there were several reports of military air crews surviving long falls from severely damaged aircraft. Flight Sergeant Nicholas Alchemade jumped at 18,000 feet without a parachute and survived as he hit pine trees and soft snow. He suffered a sprained leg. That's it. Staff Sergeant Alan McGee exited his aircraft at 22,000 feet without a parachute and survived as he landed on the glass roof of a train station. Oh. Lieutenant Ivan Chisov bailed out at 23,000 feet While he had a parachute, his plan was to delay opening it as he had been in the midst of an air battle and was concerned about getting shot while hanging below the parachute. He lost consciousness due to lack of oxygen and hit a snow-covered slope while still unconscious. While he suffered severe injuries, he was able to fly again in three months. Wow, that's wild. Julianne Kopke survived a long freefall resulting from the December 24th, 1971 crash of a Lanza Flight 508, which is a Lanza Lockheed Electra OBR 941 commercial airliner in the Peruvian rainforest. The airplane was struck by lightning during a severe thunderstorm and exploded in midair, disintegrating two miles up. Kopke, who was 17 years old at the time, fell to earth, still strapped into her seat. What? The German-Peruvian teenager survived the fall with only a broken collarbone, a gash to her right arm, and her right eye swollen shut. What the fuck? Impressive. Two miles up. Uh, As an example of free-fall survival that was not as extreme as sometimes reported in the press, a skydiver from Staffordshire was said to have plunged 6,000 feet without a parachute in Russia and survived. James Boole said that he was supposed to have been given a signal by another skydiver to open his parachute, but it came two seconds too late. Bull, who was filming the other skydiver for a television documentary, landed on snow-covered rocks and suffered a broken back and a rib. While he was lucky to survive, this was not a case of true freefall survival because he was flying a wingsuit, greatly decreasing his vertical speed. 
This was over descending terrain with deep snow cover, and he impacted while his parachute was beginning to deploy. Over the years, other skydivers has, have survived accidents where the press has reported that no parachute was open, yet they were actually being slowed by a small area of tangled parachute. They might still be very lucky to survive, uh, survive, but an impact at 80 miles per hour is much less severe than the 120 miles per hour that might occur in normal freefall. Mm-hmm. Parachute jumper and stuntman Luke Aikens successfully jumped without a parachute from about 25,000 feet into a 10,000 square foot net in California, U.S. on July 30th, 2016. It's a big net. I think I remember this. I remember seeing on TV there was a guy who, I think he like took a rocket up to space or this really high flying aircraft. They were beyond the Earth's atmosphere, and he free fall jumped out of it. Pretty much the limit where gravity still pulls you down to Earth. He jumped and landed in a net, and I think that was that one. I might be wrong, but I remember seeing this on TV. It was crazy. And lastly, the person who holds the Guinness World Record for surviving the highest fall without a parachute is J.A.T. stewardess Vensa Volovic. Volovic. She survived a fall of 33,000 feet. Jesus. On January 26, 1972, pinned within the broken fuselage of the DC-9 of J.A.T. Flight 367. The plane was brought down by explosives over Serbska Kamenis. I'm going to butcher that. In the former, Czechos- in, uh, former Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic. The Serbian stewardess suffered a broken skull, three broken vertebrae, one crushed completely, and was in a coma for 27 days. In an interview, she commented that, according to the man who found her, quote, I was in the middle part of the plane. I was found with my head down and my colleague on top of me. One part of my body with my leg was in the plane and my head was out of the plane. A catering trolley was pinned against my spine and kept me in the plane. The man who found me says I was very lucky. He was in the German army as a medic during World War II. He knew how to treat me at the site of the accident. That's fucking crazy. 33,000 feet. Can you imagine that? Without a parachute. How terrifying. So... Apparently, falling, second leading cause of accidental death, it's pretty common. Definitely a high potential of death. It's scary. Oh, fuck yeah, it is. And it's uh, pretty obvious why people develop fear of heights. But that doesn't stop me from going out roller coasters, because I fucking love them. They're great. I want to go to Six Flags. I haven't been there in forever. Me either. It's been a long time. But that is my section. What did you think of the beer? thought it was decent. Um, almost done. <laughs> it's got a fruity, fruity sort of twang to it. Yes, very um, much so. Definitely more fruit forward. But I think the, because of the fact that it's an Imperial Triple IPA mm-hmm. um, and the hops are very forward, it kind of covers the fruit. Uh, definitely a strong hop forward beer. The fruit's there. It's just, I don't know. Orange and lemon, maybe. It's good, but we've had better any IPAs, uh, DDH IPAs on the show before. Teradome being one of them. <laughs> I love Teradome. And then what was the? Uh, well, we had Beezer. Yeah, I mean that's going yeah going way back. Um, yeah, we've had a lot of any IPAs on the show, and they're all always very delicious. This one's good, but we've had better ones. Mm-hmm. So I, I understand your sentiment about being not as impressed. So, what about you? Like I said, I'm just, I don't know, I'm not impressed, but you can tell that, you know, it has potential to be a great beer. I just, you know, compare it to things that we've had that are much better. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of like, me, it's okay. It's good. We've had worse uh, DDH IPAs on the show. We've had uh, IPAs that are much more hop forward and... uh, Maybe not as complex as this one, but um, I, it's good. It's just out of all the beers that we've had on the show, definitely we've had some better ones. So I don't disagree with you. I couldn't even drink any more of it. That's disappointing. It's just kind of like, how many times am I going to say it's just kind of like, I'm annoyed by myself. 
It's just kind of like, <laughs> no, I understand. I'm not blown away. I just don't want to continue drinking it. I think because it doesn't stand out in any way that it's just Yeah, I mean, bland. compare it to our last beer, Blackberry Grunt. That definitely had some very unique things going for it. Mm-hmm. The fact that it was super fruity and tart. It was a sour beer. Um, just overall delicious. This is very similar. This one, um, Great Heights. <laughs> it's very... <laughs> you didn't think about it? <laughs> it's 12%. It's very similar to a lot of other New England IPAs that we've had before. They all sort of start to taste the same. There's less variety. I mean, the, the more hops you add to it, that'll definitely change the flavor profile of it, which I agree this is complex, utilizing four different varieties of hops. It's unique in its own regard, but we've had beers like this before. And I think it's important because we will continue to have other New England IPAs and other DDH IPAs on the show to review it as objectively as we can. Sure. Not necessarily comparing it to other things and rating it based on that, but trying to give it a fair uh, score based on how it's brewed and, and the flavor profile of itself alone. So if that makes any sense. I follow you. Cool. We have a website now, beerandfearcast.com. I'm going to say that again, beerandfearcast.com. It's live. Check it out now. This episode will be available on our episodes link. If you look at the top, uh, if you're on a computer, click on episodes. If you're on a mobile device, there's a little sidebar that you can open up. Click on episodes, and that's where you'll find this episode. We've got all of our media um, to accompany each episode on its own episode page. And then to always view our latest episode, there's a little listen now button that you can click on to view our latest episode uh, released on Spotify. Thanks to Spotify and our Instagram and Twitter is on there. It's just great. It's a great episode. Our beer list is on there. See where we rank great heights Um, and our other beers that we've had, the last five beers that we've had. So check us out there. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit. If you want to follow our socials, again, we have a live stream tomorrow. It's a public live stream. Join us. We're going to drink a beer that we haven't had in a while. We're going to talk about all the new amazing things that we've uh, come out with um, this Wednesday. And our contact page is on our about page. Send us an email with your own spooky or scary story so we can do frights and flights. (laughs) My my flights of beer have been sitting up there for nearly a year now. They're dusty. Yeah, hopefully we can do something with those. But uh, just feel free to reach out. Anything you want to let us know, it'll send us an email. So... Thank you so much for listening. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching, if you're watching us. And uh, Paige? Have a good day.